Hello, my name is Christine Reiner. I am the communications coordinator with the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association. Thank you for joining this event about leaf and fruit diseases with Amy Timmerman. The segment has been funded by a partnership with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, and SD Specialty Producers to promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. So Amy, I'm I'm really excited to learn. I've got um, a tomato garden that's not, actually not dying this year. So I'm kind of like, <laughs> what should I look out for, you know? So if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, um, and then we're just excited to learn with you. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad your tomatoes are still producing. As you can see in my background, I got some tomatoes behind me. Luckily, these are ones I harvested from my own garden. So um, there's a lot of fun things with tomatoes, but they do have their challenges, and then we're going to talk about some of those today. So if it works, I am going to go ahead and share my screen, and Perfect. then I'll say a little bit more about myself on the next slide. So let me get the screen up and going. Can I ask how large is your garden? Um, my garden is actually fairly, fairly large. I have, uh, we are a family of five. Oh, wow. Um, so I've gotten to the point that I would much rather be able to can as much as I possibly can to reduce cost. So, um, so and plus when I can it myself, I know where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an organic producer, but I know what's in there. And I also believe it just tastes a lot better too. So uh, my son who is 11 and is a seventh grader with these yellow tomatoes, uh, they're a lot sweeter and we really like them. Uh, he wants to make yellow pasta sauce and can it mm. and really throw some people for a loop when they come over to visit when we have yellow spaghetti sauce this, this winter. So it'll be a lot of fun. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Amy Turman. I'm an extension educator. So I am a county-based educator with the University of Nebraska. I am housed in Holt and Boyd County. My primarily uh, reside, uh, work out of the O'Neill office. So as you can see on the bottom here, I put a star. This is where Holt County is at. So you can kind of see I'm up in that north central portion of, of Nebraska. So you kind of get an idea where I'm from. Uh, prior to uh, coming here, I guess the big thing I should point out, I'm considered a crops and water educator right now. Uh, I deal with primarily crops, but prior to my position up here 11 years ago, I was the coordinator of the plant pest diagnostic clinic in Lincoln for the University of Nebraska and was 100% responsible for identifying all the plant diseases that were submitted to the clinic. Um, because of that uh, role that I had, um, I was also, and I still serve as a member of a panel called Backyard Farmer. It is a live show that is released by Nebraska Public Media. We are in our 71st season of with this being on the air. We air from April until the second week of September, every Thursday night, live Q&A. There's a Facebook link there. And then we also have a YouTube. So every, or every hour long show is recorded. We have an entomologist. We have a turf chair, we have a rotten spots or diseases, which I am, and then we have a horticulturist, and then we have several other videos about different vegetable diseases or vegetable or gardening issues that you might run into, which might be beneficial depending on what you run into. So, and with that, so my background is plant pathology. Um, I have learned a lot of agronomy along the way, but I just love talking about diseases. So I was really excited to be able to talk about tomato diseases. I don't get to do it that often anymore, uh, but it's a great topic for me to talk about. So before we start today, I'm gonna actually make us go right back to the beginning. Um, before we start talking about diseases, we need to really get a really good sense of what causes the diseases, what type of organisms that we're dealing with. So for plant pathology, Typically, we talk about diseases as anything that impacts the productivity or the aesthetic quality of the plant. And so for us on tomatoes, we're going to be looking at production as a whole and how that impacts. So we talk about abiotic and biotic organisms. 
we're going to focus primarily on biotics. So those are caused by living organisms. And so on the slide right now, what I'm showing you is the common sizes of our plant causing disease organisms, our plant pathogens. So as you can see here, I have a plant cell on the outside edge. This is a single cell in that plant. And then we have several common pathogens that will impact us. Nematodes are going to be our largest. This is just the head of a nematode. So it's pretty, pretty invasive into that cell and can be very detrimental to the plant. The next group we have are the fungi. They're the most common, but they're the second largest. Then we go to bacterium. And the last group we deal with are viruses. These are the smallest that we will deal with. The other group that we deal with are called the abiotic. And I will talk about a few abiotic diseases at the end. Abiotic is things that are caused by the environment. They're not caused by a particular organism or living organism, uh, which we look at for biotic. So when we look at these plant pathogens, let's start with the smallest, okay? So the smallest we're gonna deal with viruses. Viruses as a whole cannot be seen with a light microscope. So because of that, diagnosis can be a little more difficult when we're trying to identify those diseases. We're gonna look at the symptoms of the plant. Usually those plants are gonna be stunted, chlorotic. Chlorotic means they're yellow in coloration instead of that nice green. And they may not produce seed or have really small fruit production associated with it. When we look at viruses, they cannot move from plant to plant on their own. They have to have vectors that are able to move them from plant to plant. And these are transmitted by several insects, aphids, mites, beetles, other insects. They can be moved by nematodes and fungi, which are pathogens, but can also just be saprophytic that are just feeding on dead organic material or other organisms. And then the last big culprit that I did not put on here is transmitting tomato diseases is us. So whenever we prune a plant with our clippers and the plant is infected, we can move that virus either with our fingers or also with our shears that we're using. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other situations where we'll see human movement of these diseases. The next largest or the next largest that we'll deal with are bacteria. So keep in mind, you have to go back to biology 101. Um, my fifth grader at school is going through what are bacteria and fungi. Bacteria are single celled organisms. They cannot force themselves into a plant. They have to go through an opening in the plant to actually cause infection. So those openings can be from the natural openings in the plant, the stomatas, or from any type of injury that occurs, whether it's wind damage, sand blasting, insect damage, or hail injury, or us pruning is an opportunity for that bacteria to move in. Bacteria, some have what we call flagellas or basically little tails that allow them to swim in surface water to be able to move to that wound to be able to cause infection. With bacteria, one of the first signs that we look for to be able to identify the disease is something called water soaking. And the best way to or explain water soaking, as you can see up in this picture, this here is water soaking. If you take any plant and if you pinch the leaf, you're going to get a dark green discoloration because you've bruised the plant. That's water soaking. And that's because of the bacteria moving in and starting to destroy the cells. That's why we get that bruising or water soaking appearance that will then move on to cause us some of the other symptoms. The nice thing with bacteria, when we look at it as a diagnostic standpoint, we can't always necessarily see the bacteria cell by cell, depending on the type of light microscope that we're dealing with. But even with some of our basic light microscope, what we're able to see instead is bacterial flooding is like what I like to call it. So if you look at the second picture down here, this very dark image here on the upper part of the picture is actually the tissue cells. So this is this be a piece of tomato that we have there that I've just cut out. And then you see this plume cloud, this kind of gray discoloration. These here is all single cell bacteria cells that are rushing out of the vascular system of the plant. So we're able to see those and use that as a good characteristic or good diagnostic tool to actually identify the bacterial disease, which makes it a lot easier. The next group that we deal with on size are fungi or fungus. 
Uh, keep in mind, fungi is the largest group of pathogens that we typically deal with with plant diseases. Fungi are able, some of them are able to force their way into a plant. So they don't need an opening to cause infection. Instead, when we look at them, we can kind of look at a fungi like a seed. So on this picture here, these are the spores equivalent to a seed. The spores create a germ tube that will come out and then they're able to create a device or apothorium on top and they're able to push their way into the plant cell. And that's how they cause infection. Some will come through the stomate. But for these spores to germinate, they need free water. So we need to have moisture in the environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be that we have to have water sitting on the leaf surface. Humidity is at times enough moisture to allow those spores to germinate to cause infection. And so because of that, they're able to reproduce by these spores. Spores are reproduced by asexual and sexual reproduction. And then once we have infection, they're able to move either through the air, rain splashing from leaf to leaf um, is their primary movement uh, from place to place. Fungi and bacteria can overwinter in debris of a crop that's been infected the year before. They can overwinter in the soil also. So there's a lot of different ways that we can see uh, bacteria and fungi that are able to move on. And then the last group we have are nematodes. These are those very large organisms. In all reality, nematodes are microscopic worms, uh, very closely related to uh, worms that we'll find in our pets like heartworm, tapeworm, uh, very closely related. Now nematodes, uh, as you can see here, we can't see them with the naked eye typically, but we can see them through a light microscope. They can feed on roots above and below plant parts. So a lot of times we talk about them below ground, affecting the roots, but we do have some foliar feeding. And on roots themselves, typically the roots are gonna become distorted, what we call bottle brushing. So if you've ever seen a bottle brush, you're going to have that main part of that bottle and then all these little fingers coming off to clean the bottle, right? And that's what the roots do themselves. The nematodes like to feed on the root tips. And when those root tips are gone, that is also where the roots gonna expand. It sends a signal to the plant going, I need more roots. And so the plant is triggered and it will send out an abundance of roots because it needs it to absorb that food and moisture, food and water for its survival. The other thing we can have is it can produce galls and basically bubbles or balls that form on the root itself. Some people will refer to these looking like rosary beads. So you'll have a nice chain and then you're going to have a bead. And that is from that nematode setting up a feeding site and forcing the plant to accommodate it. So for us today, which is really important, we're not going to talk about nematodes because typically we don't have nematode issues that impact tomatoes for us in this north central part of the country. Now, if you have happened to do any work in the southern part of the state, so Alabama, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Florida, Texas, there are root nematodes that will attack tomatoes. And so be aware that as you go further south, though you're going to run into those situations, those nematodes are not able to survive our winters in Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa in general. So the other big thing I want everybody to know is we're talking about plant pathogens here. We went through the bacteria, the fungi, and the nematodes. Please keep in mind, you are always going to find those organisms in our environment. Some of them will attack plants, some of them will attack insects, and some of them will attack each other. So we have nematodes that will feed on each other, we have fungi that will feed on each other, and then we have some of them that will attack the animal systems that they run into, such as ourselves and other animals. So there, it, it's a very diverse environment, but we're just gonna focus on the ones today that feed and attack plants. Now, I always give my entomologists a hard time because in some ways, insects are, are easy. You have a bug, it feeds on your plant, you identify the bug and we're able to treat it and we're able to monitor its movement. With plant diseases, we have a third leg that we have to deal with and we call this disease triangle. And that third leg is the environment. So we can have the host, the plant material, we can have the pathogen, but if the environment is not conducive, we will not have disease development. 
And each pathogen or disease has a different requirement on environment, whether it's temperature, whether it is amount of water available or leaf wetness, that all plays a big part. It is only when all three come together do we actually end up with the disease, as you can see here, where they all over across here. So we can have situations where we can have a perfect, perfect storm almost, where the environmental conditions are conducive, we have the very susceptible host and we have the pathogen and we have a major epidemic of disease and it could really impact our crops that we're trying to grow. But then we can look in our crystal ball, which doesn't work really well, but then the other years we may not see any disease because of the environmental conditions. The one thing we have to keep in mind when we look at tomato diseases is we are controlling part of that environment. We are controlling roll spacing. We're controlling how much water they're getting, how they're getting the water, whether it's above irrigation or a drip line system. And so we're able to manipulate that. And we call that a microclimate because of what we're able to do because of the way we're growing that crop. So if you're running into issues and we'll talk about management through each of these diseases, keep in mind, how can I impact that system to reduce the environment and thus reduce the amount of disease pressure that I have? And then the last component that we don't like to talk about is time. So if you think about your cells, there are certain diseases or certain illnesses that are going to impact us more depending on our age. One of those easy ones that we can think about is RSV. We know RSV can be very detrimental to young children, especially infants, right? They're more vulnerable. Plants are the same way. There are certain diseases that can impact it more when it's younger. And then it builds immunity and it isn't a big deal later on in life. There are some diseases, we can look at our RSV again, as you get older and you are in that older population, that retired population, once again, you become susceptible again to the disease and plant diseases are the same way. I maybe wasn't susceptible as, as a young seedling, but now I'm very susceptible as I'm reaching my age. The other trick with timing, when we look at management, and we want to look at fungicide applications or uh, copper treatments for bacteria is where am I in that growth development of the plant? Am I going to get my best bang for my buck? So we're recording this Zoom first week in September. If I had a major outbreak of fungal disease at this time, really is it economical for me to spray at this point in time? Depending on where you live, maybe yes or maybe no. For me in my part of the state where I live in the country, my average frost date is September 27th. I'm also getting to the end of my growing season. It doesn't make sense for me to spend money on a fungicide application when I am so near the end of the production year. So you need to stop and look at where am I at in the production year, whether for timing, whether this is something I need to treat or is this something I'm going to make record I need to make sure I monitor next year when I come back in with that crop. All right, the last thing with basic plant pathology 101 and it's talking about symptom distribution. And this isn't just plant pathology. This is gonna to apply to uh, herbicide injury and also insect injury. We wanna look at the plants and what's happening in that field at three different levels. We wanna look at it at a field, plant and leaf scale type of situation because that's gonna give us an indication or how you're working through things. What could be the possible cause? Uh, where do I need to go for resources to be looking at determining what that cause is and moving forward? Or if you're giving like a person like myself a call, I'm going to be asking those questions because I'm going to be start doing that checklist in my head going, oh, you see it here and here, and this is a distribution. I'm probably going to lean toward this disease or that disease, and it helps cross some things off. So when we look at field distribution, and I apologize, I got pictures of turf, but it's very visual for us to see. Are there certain patterns we see if we step back on what's going on? So as we look at the top left picture here, are we seeing stripes in the field? Um, the big thing to keep in mind with diseases is they typically don't develop in linear fashion. I don't find diseases in a line. If I'm seeing stuff in a line, a lot of times I'm gonna be looking at some type of cultural practice that we've done. And so for the turf here, we see these lines and if you didn't know, I know it because I've seen the picture and I was out in the field, this is where they put in new water lines. So we're looking at a soil compaction issue because 
the ground was broken up and we're able to see a difference in the roots are able to penetrate. The other things we're gonna look at is if we look at the upper right here, maybe we're looking at the low areas in a field or high areas in the field, which could be an indication of too wet or too dry. But too wet and too dry is also gonna be, give me another indication of different diseases I might look at or insects. The bottom left, uh, this is to indicate that maybe we have trees down here in that bottom corner and we have a shading effect. Or this is an entrance to the field where you dropped everything down and I introduced a new pathogen and it's been gradiented out. Or I started spraying and I had a spray contaminant and now it's starting to flush out. And then the last one here, this one's a fun one. Um, we kind of see some random patterns in there. This is actually uh, lawnmower blight and golf cart blight. So the pathogen is actually able to be moved by the equipment uh, when it was driven on when it was wet. And so even in tomato production, depending on how you are harvesting and the carts that you're moving through there, your carts can move disease from plant to plant if it is conducive for environmental and you get the pathogen on there. So something to keep in mind, it, could I be the cause of that movement? Once we know the field, then we're gonna look at the plant distribution. Where am I actually seeing it on the plants? And the nice thing with tomatoes is they're large enough for us to be able to see. Am I only seeing it in the lower part of the canopy, the lower third, or is it in the middle third? Or am I only seeing the upper third? That's also gonna give us some indication on potential diseases, depending on how they overwinter, how those introductions are going to occur. But please keep in mind, we have diseases that will impact those roots and crowns that I'm not gonna talk about, but we're gonna have impact here, but we're not gonna see the symptoms down here. We're gonna see the symptoms on the upper part of the canopy because that is the last place that's gonna get the food and the water. And so we're gonna see the plants wilt. So even though you're seeing wilting on top, don't forget that we have those roots to look at because they can be an indication of something else going on. So we wanna make sure we look at the whole plant. And then the last thing is we wanna look at the leaf. So we're gonna get closer into that plant and really look at the distribution on the plant. And when you're talking to people on the phone or even Zoom or emailing, adjectives are huge in helping to explain what is going on. Am I seeing uh, on this bottom left picture, are all the holes that I'm seeing in that plant all uniform in shape? They are a perfect circle all the way through that leaf. That's gonna be an indication for somebody that you're talking to of, oh, if they're perfect circles, we well, might not be dealing with the disease issue. One thing I might have you look at is, could you have leaf cutter bees that cut out perfect circles to go into their nest? And leaf cutter bees are a great pollinator, so we're not gonna wanna do anything to really hurt them. Um, am I seeing yellowing? As we see in the middle bottom here, is that yellowing along the veins? Is it all the way across? Is it stippled? Uh, am I seeing more than yellow? Am I seeing brown? Am I seeing purple? Um, is it just on the leaf edge that we have on the upper top here? Those are all very important descriptions on what we potentially could be running into. So um, I joke with my kids a lot that uh, adjectives are huge and they look at me going, no, they're not. Uh, my English teacher doesn't like it at school, but I'm like, in this area, adjectives, as many adjectives as you can use to describe what's going on is really critical. So that is the field plant leaf distribution patterns that we want you to look at as you're trying to go through disease identification and management or even insect ID and identification. So that is the beginning part. Now let's dive in into some of those actual leaf and fruit diseases that we see on tomatoes. And we're gonna start off with the fungal diseases first because they are the most common that you're gonna run into. And the first one we're talking about is early blight. Early blight is a fungal disease that I find in practically every garden or production system as a whole. So early blight is caused by a fungi called Altenaria. It lives in the soil or overwinters in the soil and in the debris. And it's just a very common pathogen to have. Now, this disease can happen very early in the season and can continue to progress. When the disease first starts, you're gonna see these small brownish lesions that start on the leaf surface. So hopefully you can see my pointer here. They start off with very small little brown lesions, nothing too big. You know, a lot of times you're gonna see a yellow halo surrounding it because that's the tissue is starting to turn chlorotic and it's starting to die. 
The big diagnostic key is as those lesions get larger and they expand, um, as you see in this middle picture, they develop what we call coincentric rings. It's like looking at the tree rings in a tree that you cut. Each of those rings are indicating the growth pattern of that fungus. So the fungus started its infection in the very center and it keeps working its way out. Each one of those rings is actually spores being produced by the fungus to continue infection. So you're gonna take a look at it. You're gonna look for those coincentric rings, which is an indication of early blight. Um, you can also see this on the fruit. Uh, that's where the disease is going to congregate. And this disease is then going to get moved from plant to plant and from the plant itself by rain splashing. So every time we have a rain event or the sprinkler, a water droplet's going to hit this. It's able to collect some spores. When it bounces back up, it moves it up to the next leaf and it continues to progress up the plant. So this is a disease I'm going to see on the lower part of the canopy first and work its way up. Now, we're going to talk management here in a little bit, but I'm going to go through all the fungal diseases first and then talk about their management as a whole system because we're going to manage them all the same. All right, so we have early blight. The next fungal disease that we see very commonly on leaves is called septoria leaf spot. Now, it's a little bit different than early blight. This is going to look more like a bacterial disease at the beginning. It's going to be a water-soaked lesion that turns into these darker spots, okay? These darker spots are going to be tan in the center and gray on the outside. As you can see, they're not as big as they are with early blight. They can coalesce, as you can see down here on this lower part, they've coalesced or merged together to form a larger lesion, but they're never going to have that coocentric ring. If you would take a hand lens, you can look in the inside and you can see tiny black specks, which are the spores, um, but typically you're not gonna see that ring pattern and they're not gonna get as large as early blight. Uh, typically I will find this also in the lower canopy and work its way up in the canopy. Uh, not as prevalent as early blight, but it's definitely out there. And then the last one I really want to talk about here is anthracnose. Anthracnose can be a very detrimental fungal disease uh, because it attacks the fruit. And it's attacking the fruit right when it's starting to ripen. And those of you with home gardens understand the situation. You've been watching that one tomato that's starting to turn colors. And then all of a sudden you go out there and you see this massive of black bleh. And so with this fungus, what it does is it infects the skin, infects the fruit. It initially starts as a like a, an indented spot that most of the time you don't notice it, but it moves very quickly to become a half inch, very sunken. And then it, it continues to expand out and that center is going to sink in. We're going to see black spores being produced and you're just going to finally just as it progresses, you're just going to see this full decay of that fruit as a whole. And really the fruit becomes unedible at that point in time. I will have to say, if you're able to catch it early like it is in this picture, you're able to cut that section out and are still able to use that fruit uh, for consumption. But depending on how you're using it, if it's for farmer's market, uh, usually customers aren't going to use it. If it's going into a production system, such as it's going to be going into making pasta sauce, depending on the vendor, they may or may not take it uh, because it does impact the quality of that processed good. So, all right, so let's talk about management of all of these together. The easiest management tool for early blight, septoria, and anthracnose is making sure we have very good feed and transplants that we're putting into that field or into that garden. Uh, some of these pathogens are easily transmitted by infected seedlings. We don't see anything and then we're able to introduce it. The other real, really simple way is using resistant cultivars. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you how you can look those up. Depending on what your quality is, what the consumer is looking for, sometimes we don't have those options. Keep in mind our heirloom varieties that we like to use, uh, Cherokee or purple Cherokee is one of those are very susceptible and have no resistance. So it depends on what you're after and if you're able to get away with using resistant varieties or not. All of these pathogens that we're looking at here needs leaf wetness. So we need 
the fruit and the leaf to actually have free water sitting on it. And all of these need at least six hours of leaf wetness to actually allow that spore to germinate and cause infection. A lot of people look at me going and say, six hours is a long time for us to be wet. But I'm gonna make you stop and think of where you live. When we're in the middle of the summer, say July, August, even the first part of September, when do you have dew set in? Because we have higher humidities depending on where you're at. For me, if it's a really humid summer, I have dew set happening about eight or nine o'clock at night. And when is that dew coming off? Depends once again, where you're at. For where I live, and my husband's going out to, hey, we're not gonna start raking until about nine, 10 o'clock in the morning because we have so much dew. So I've just had 12 hours of leaf wetness that occurred, which allowed ample time for that fungus to germinate and cause infection. Now, with that, as you look at my point down a little bit further, is irrigation. We want to avoid overhead irrigation because we want to reduce that leaf wetness time, but also we're not splashing it. Now, if I am going to do overhead irrigation because I have no other option, making sure we're irrigating during the time that I'm going to have that natural leaf wetness time because that shortens my period. <clears throat> If I have leaf wetness until nine o'clock in the morning, but I don't turn my sprinklers on until 930, and now I just extended that leaf wetness period for another two or three hours, which increases my probability for disease development. So if I can sprinkle and water, if I have to over irrigate during that dew period time, it also reduces that disease pressure. Whenever possible, we want to remove that infected plant material uh, and get it out to reduce that inoculum and potential movement of it. Now for early blight, <coughs> excuse me, since it starts at the lower part of the plant and works its way up, one of the first suggestions I'm going to have for you is once we get plants establishment, pinching off those lower leaves so they're not touching the soil surface will reduce your uh, chances and incidence of septoria and early blight. Keep in mind, you can remove about a bottom third of that plant and not impact the productivity of it when it's first getting established. So something to consider there. Um, I talked about overhead watering, maintaining a good balanced soil fertility. But the other one I forgot to list on here that is important because most of these fungi are gonna be soil borne, putting down a mulch, whether it is uh, uh, mulch fabric, if it is straw, newspaper, Anything that's going to reduce that soil from potentially bouncing up and uh, depositing on that leaf and reducing that incidence of, of the host and pathogen coming in contact really helps. But also that mulch is also going to help with watering as we get later into the growing season to maintain irrigation and maintain some of the other abiotic diseases that we're going to run into. All right, so this is an example. I took this off of Johnny's... Uh, Johnny Seed, which is a common retailer. Uh, every company is gonna look a little bit different. <clears throat> um, so what I did is I pulled up all their inner indeterminate tomato varieties. You have their names, but as you go over here, they have disease resistance. And then on the right hand of the screen, what those codes mean. So if I'm looking for something that has early blight resistance, we're gonna be looking for EB, tobacco, or <coughs> Leaf blights in general will be LB. So you can make those selections uh, prior to the growing season when you are, are, are buying those seeds. And the nice thing is this is a really simple way to manage those disease without having to do chemicals or different components. Now, I did not put it on the list. Chemicals are an option. Uh, when I talk tomatoes, depending on the scale, I'm always gonna try to encourage no fungicide application. Um, if you are with tomatoes, make sure you look at those pre-harvest intervals very carefully uh, because this is an edible crop. And if it is a seven-day pre-harvest interval, that can really impact your production. So make sure you're looking at those pre-harvest intervals very, very closely. Um, and I'm not going to give actual fungicide app recommendations today. Um, but if you're wanting some, you can reach out to me. There's some other resources also available to find that. All right, the next one I wanna talk about is late blight. This is a fungus-like organism. 
Uh, this can be a very detrimental disease uh, when it does attack. Uh, this disease causes infection on the leaves. It causes water soaked. But as you can see here, the lesions enlarge very rapidly and turn pale to green in coloration, and then they get moldy. Uh, keep in mind, the late blight is also the same. This is the same pathogen that causes late blight on potatoes. They're both solanaceous. This is the disease that caused the potato um, famine in Ireland many moons ago. And this is what pretty much devastated the Irish community. Uh, people starved and caused that major influx of Im immigration into the U.S. and to other countries because they weren't able to raise potatoes because of this disease. On the fruit itself, where it's very detrimental, is it starts off with this dark olive greasy spot, and then it enlarges, as you can see on this picture, very quickly. This enlargement here, this is two days after infection. I mean, it moves rapidly. This is a disease that likes cool, wet weather. AKY why it did so well in Ireland because it's foggy um, and cool and damp there. This is a disease that will move in very quickly when we have a problem. It isn't something we typically see. We do run into epidemics of it. And the last epidemic I was really familiar with happened in 2018, which has been a while ago. But what happened there is the late blight, plants were infected at the nursery where it was distributing the plants out. So the nursery is based out of North Carolina. They did not know the plants were infected and then moved it across the nation. And because of that, it was being moved into major box stores like Walmart, Home Depot, Menards, and the workers there did not know the plants were sick and the spores were then getting moved out. I know there was some major tomato producers in that New York uh, state area uh, that were organic producers. This disease came in and completely wiped them out and they had to start spraying, otherwise they were gonna lose their entire crop. Uh, but they lost a lot of profit from that because it took five years to go back into an organic program. Um, but it just happened to be their first field was right next door to a major box store. So keep in mind, our distributors can be at fault at times and that's why we really need to take a really close look at those transplants as we purchase them. So how do we manage it? We want to dispose those plants as quickly as possible. We need to remove them. And this is not one that you put in a coal pile or a recycle bin. This is one that you want to bury, throw in the garbage, get away as far as possible. You also, as you're looking at rotation, you want to destroy any volunteers because they can harbor the disease and cause a bridge to occur. Uh, scout those fields regularly and fungicide applications. If you have it move in, it's the only way you can do it. Follow those label instructions and you are spraying on a calendar, not according to symptoms. Because once you have symptoms, it is too late. So once again, this is not something you're gonna run into frequently, but you definitely could. And depending on where you're at in that South Dakota, North Dakota area also, with potatoes in production and it going back and forth, that is one to take a look at. All right, let's move into those bacterial diseases. Uh, the first one we're gonna look at is bacterial spot. Uh, this causes symptoms on the leaves and the stems. It starts off on the leaves as a circular or ir irregular shape up to an eighth of an inch, like down here. Um, it looks very similar to septoria that we talked about, but it doesn't have that grayish center. This is always gonna stay black to brown in coloration, and it would have a halo and it will continue to expand and uh, cause bigger, bigger lesions. Where we get more concerned about bacterial spot is on the fruit itself. Uh, this disease will only affect the fruit when it's in the green stage. So this is all of our immature fruit that's on there. That's when it's susceptible. It will start off as a water-soaked lesion, and then it enlarges to this one-eighth to one-quarter inch. Um, it will be gray to brown in coloration, and it sinks in, it's scabby, so it gets pitted as a whole. Um, the nice thing about it is this is all superficial. It doesn't work any further into the fruit. If you peel the fruit, you're not gonna see any damage on the inside. It just becomes an aesthetic quality issue depending on where you plan on uh, selling that produce. The next one we have is called bacterial spec. I know it gets confusing. We have spot and spec. Uh, spec also will attack the foliar 
foliage and the fruit. It is smaller than spot. We get lesions that are 1 16th or 1 quarter, as you can see here. These are slightly raised. You can kind of feel them. Uh, where you really see them is on the fruit and feel them. Once again, we'll attack the immature fruit when it's green. But these spots, if you run your finger across them, are raised and you can feel those little bumps. Uh, the nice thing with bacterial spec is it's all superficial. You can take your fingernail and actually just scrape it off. So it doesn't hurt the fruit at all, doesn't cause a pit. It is all superficial damage. And for both of these diseases, typically we don't recommend any management recommendations uh, with coppers just because they're very superficial. But if you are having a major issue, how do we manage them? Good sanitation is gonna be huge because it's gonna reside in the residue. So we wanna make sure in the fall, we take that all off. We wanna rotate those positions in that farm or garden. Uh, to assure that we remove that inoculum, avoid overcrowding. It's a bacteria, it can't cause its own opening. So we're gonna have to have free water on those leaves. So if we're able to pull the canopies apart, get some good airflow in there, the bacterium isn't going to be able to move in. Um, if we can water from the base is always going to be critical and making sure we have high quality seed um, in our seed or our transplants before we put them into, the, into our field. All right, the last group that we're gonna look at is viruses. Virus infected fruits do occur fairly frequently in tomatoes. And so we will see a lot of different patterns. A lot of times we see the patterns or the symptoms on the fruit themselves, um, but this can be caused by several different components. So I'm gonna give you a list. We got tomato bushy step, we have tomato mosaic, we have tomato spotted wilt. The trick with all viruses is once a plant is infected, there's nothing we can do for it. We can't give the plant a shot like we're able to do with some humans and, and animal uh, virus issues. Once the plant is infected, there's nothing you can do. So typically what we're gonna be doing is identifying the plants and roguing them out or removing them from the field to assure that we're not getting transmission further down. So to give another look at, oh, I forgot eggplant mosaic. Um, some other symptoms that we can see very commonly, and I talked about these with viruses, is we can have rogosity, is what we call it, or bootstrapping. The leaves are going to curl. They're going to bind in on themselves. It looks very similar to growth regulator herbicide injury. They just curl around. Now, if you're trying to distinguish, is it viral or is it herbicide? Herbicide, it will grow out of it. Viral, it will continue to stay on. We're also going to see yellowing of the tissue or chlorosis. We also see stunting of the plant. Um, the other thing we'll see on the fruit uh, with tomato spotted or tomato bushy stunt and tomato spotted wilt virus, uh, you get this mosaic pattern on the fruit of yellows, reds, and oranges. Um, I will tell you, you need to make sure you know what is supposed to be normal for that variety. There are some varieties of tomatoes that will give you the speckling pattern um, or yellow and orange and red all together. So know what is normal. If this is not normal, then we're most likely looking at a viral infection. You can still eat the fruit, but it just doesn't look aesthetically as pleasing. Um, the other culprit that can cause this spotting uh, that we can see those yellow blotches is called cloudy spot. This is not actually a plant disease. This is actually caused by stink bug damage. So I got some pictures of some common stink bugs. So when stink bugs are feeding, they're non-selective. They just stick their mouth parts into things and, until they find something that they like. But when they stick their mouth part into that fruit to determine if they like it, they release some enzymes that start breaking down the plant material so they can absorb it better. And that's what causes the yellow spots. So you need to stop and look, okay, Am I seeing some fruit that's looking a little discolored? Make sure you look to see if you have stink bite damage before you start going, oh no, I got a virus issue and I need to start roguing plants out. The main culprit for our viruses in tomatoes are going to be moved by insects to a certain, a certain extent. Thrips are very common, aphids are very common. Um, the one I do want to bring up is tobacco streak and tomato tomato spotted wilt. Um, here we have thrips, but also by sap. The big important thing here on sap is human transmission. Both of these diseases also occur in tobacco. And so historically there's been an issue 
with some producers, whether it's traditional field or greenhouse, if they have individuals in their operation that are smokers or chewers, they are able to still get that uh, virus on their hand from their cigarettes, from the tobacco or from their chew. And then as they were smoking, they get that virus on their hands and then they went to go work on the plant materials and they're automatically transmitting it to the tomatoes. So because of that, a lot of tomato, larger tomato production systems are going to either, if you are a smoker, you're required to wear gloves to assure that we're not getting that accidental transmission because of your nicotine addiction, which is fine. We just want to make sure. And then also if they are smoking, they are smoking and putting those butts far away from the field or in a different spot than the field to sure we don't get that accidental transmission. So something we don't always consider, but something as simple as my nic nicotine fix can also be causing disease movement. All right, the last few slides I wanna go through here are caused by abiotic diseases, are caused by the environment, but we end up with a lot of these every single year and people have questions. So the first one I wanna focus on here is blossom end rot. Pretty much anybody that has grown tomatoes or anything in the garden has seen blossom end rot at some point in time. <clears throat> the fruit at the very blossom end or on the bud end of the, of the fruit, you get this tan to black and soft spot we can get secondary fungi moving in, secondary bacteria that will cause it to break down. Um, this can occur at any stage of development. Um, in tomatoes, we see it on larger sliced tomatoes. Um, but the nice thing to keep in mind with uh, blossom end rot is environmentally related. So I may have it early in the season. I may not see it at all in the same plant later on. Now, in general, there are several theories that are going around about what is the cause of blossom end rot. Uh, most of the theories and what the experts are saying from research is blossom end rot is primarily caused by uh, uh, watering not being consistent. Uh, water has a lot to do with blossom end rot uh, development. There are some theories out there looking at calcium that's a calcium deficiency, um, but that one hasn't been holding up long term. So how do we manage it? Because of that watering thing, we want to make sure we're keeping that soil moist and keeping it fairly regular. We know there's going to be large rain events that occur and different components like that. But if we can keep the moisture as regular as possible and its consistency is going to reduce. Applying that mulch to retain the moisture is going to help. Avoid root injury if you're uh, coming in and cultivating, avoiding that cultivation closer to the plant. Uh, that has shown because if you get too close to the plant, you're nipping off those roots that root tips that are responsible for absorbing and translocating the most water. And so then we have a transportation issue and will cause blossom in right. And then there's just some varieties that are more susceptible. Uh, take, take really good records. Uh, if you've had a major issue two years in a row, if you can pick a different variety and not use that one again. And then the other big thing is it's just gonna harbor more disease, remove those fruits, fruits and dispose of them so we don't get other secondary issues issues going on. <clears throat> the next one is sun scald. The sun scald is going to start off with a pale yellow to white spot on the side of the fruit. Um, this is the side of the fruit that's facing the sun. As it continues to progress, it gets flat and grayish and gets almost a paper-like texture to it. Um, it will get moved in by other decaying organisms, fungi, bacteria. It will turn black over time but that isn't the cause, it's because of the sun. And that happens once we, all of a sudden we expose that plant to a lot of sunlight. So whether we pruned really heavy or we had a hail event come through or insect feeding and the plant just isn't able to compensate. Just think about yourself when you go out to the lake for the first time for the summer, if you don't put on sunblock, what happens? You turn into a big red crab, right? Exact same thing that's happening with this fruit. It's not been exposed and all of a sudden, boom, it is. And instead of turning red and crab-like, it turns white and paper-like. So how do we manage sun scald? Trying to maintain that plant as healthy as possible, try to manage the disease and the insect issues. Uh, if we're pruning, making sure we're not pruning too heavy uh, around those fruits, especially if we're gonna have a really bright, sunny, hot couple of days. And then the other big thing is once you have fruits that have developed sun scald, you're just gonna remove them because they're never going to recover. Uh, and then it's just setting up an opportunity for secondary diseases and insects to move in. 
All right, I have a couple more abiotics. Uh, growth cracks are, are a common question I get. Why are my tomatoes cracking? And those cracks can radiate from the stem and go away around. They can come from the stem and go laterally down to the down to the blossom end. It's really hit and miss on how they actually develop. And then we're going to see this black formation coming in. Those are secondary bacteria and fungi moving in, just feeding on the dead organic matter and going, hey, I got a food source. This is pretty yummy. I might as well take an opportunity. Growth cracks 100% are caused by moisture. And so we see it after maybe we have our irrigation system broke down for a while or you're on vacation and you didn't water. And then all of a sudden we get a heavy rain event very saturated or we finally watered. And what happens is we've added all that water and the tomato fruit has a lot of water. And so it swells too fast because of that onset of all this water and that's what causes the crack. So maintaining water on that soil is really gonna be key for this again. Um, the other trick is varieties is a big thing. Uh, if you have a variety that no matter what you do, you maintain that moisture as best as you can and it still cracks, start looking at different varieties that may not be as susceptible. And this one, cat facing is always a very unique one that makes the tomatoes look really strange. Uh, the affected fruit are somewhat flat and have corky scars here, as you can see on the capsule end or the blossom end of the fruit. Uh, the cavities can indent fairly deep into the plant or into that fruit. Uh, the actual cause is really unknown. Uh, they want to lean toward a genetic environmental uh, interaction, but you can have the same variety in your in your garden or your field, but only one plant will do it. So why did that one plant versus the other 50 did not do it? Who knows? We have no idea. Um, management wise, because we don't know the actual cause, we don't have any management. Uh, we do know there's some varieties that are more susceptible than others. So, you know, this is gonna come back down to experience. Uh, avoid those if you have a field for some odd reason that is always prone to it. Uh, if you start seeing a lot of fruit like this, depending on where your fruit is going to go, go ahead and rogue it out, um, especially if it's going to go into farmer's markets or fresh produce. People aren't going to buy them uh, flat out because they don't look right. So just go ahead and remove that plant so you don't have to worry about uh, selecting those, those tomatoes out uh, because the whole plant is going to do it in general. And then the last one I have is something called yellow shoulders. Uh, if you've never seen yellow shoulders is when you have your tomato fruit, they're starting to turn yellow, but the shoulders or the top part of those tomatoes stay yellow or green. And it doesn't matter how long you keep them on the vine, they stay yellow and green. And so you go, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and eat them or process them or whatever. Those portions stay hard and they're not pleasant at all. Where, where we typically see it is when we have a very hot temperature come in. So we usually see this develop in tomatoes when we hit hot weather above 90 degrees. So it's in a total environmental, some varieties are more prone than others. So there isn't a lot you can do besides knowledge and history. Um, but if you're running into like this summer, I know some parts of the area of the country, you know, we had hundred degree temperatures for five, six, seven, 12 days. And then we saw a lot of this yellow shoulders that occurred with it. What can you do with the fruit? Try to use it as best as possible, but until the temperatures cool down, that variety is just gonna to continue to have it for you. Um, if it's going to go into processing, if it's gonna go into ketchup or pasta sauce or something like that, typically they're still able to use it. If it's going into fresh production, you're gonna to have to provide a little bit of a discount. People just usually cut out that portion because it's just hard. Um, it's not pleasant to eat, so. Um, just one of those abiotic things that we run into. And with that, that is all the leaf and fruit diseases I have for you on tomatoes. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may run into. Uh, there's my email address, my phone number. I also gave you my Twitter handle. You're welcome to uh, send me a message via Twitter. Um, happy to answer any questions. I know there's a lot of publications online from several of the different universities that go into more depth about each disease specifically. Um, just Google search them, um, or, or like I said, feel free to reach out to me um, or any of your local extension folks. Uh, there's plant pathologists everywhere. We're happy to answer those questions. So with that, that's all I have for you today.
Thank you so much, Amy. That was that was so much information that I, I, as a, you know, like a small gardener had been wondering and I didn't even know where to Google search. So this has been so insightful and amazing. And I, my head is exploding with knowledge, I feel. <laughs> um, I know I threw a lot at you and then like 45 minutes to an hour. I apologize. <laughs> no, I appreciate it because you know, some of the things I was like, well, why is this tomato still green? Like, maybe I'm just, it just needs more time. And, and so when you said that last part, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. That will go either in the, for seeding or the compost. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important, like to, to share your knowledge. And I, I want to thank you again for joining us today because we do appreciate you talking about this topic. Um, and just helping us kind of combat our, our leaf and fruit diseases. I mean, um, you know, like you said, once a virus is in there, you can't do anything about it. And so mm -hmm. maybe it'll help someone save some time, or, you know, have a different um, process from the beginning to help right. eliminate some frustration. <laughs> right. And some of these diseases can move in and be very detrimental pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So y you don't necessarily have weeks to make a decision sometimes we need to be making those decisions right now especially with a you know if you have a large operation that could really be detrimental to your season yes so thank you i um i want to thank everybody for watching and if you want more information we do have amy's contact here in our description um you can reach out to her via email you can also check out the nebraska extension site um she mm -hmm. has a great resource of called the backyard farmer um where they they talk on other topics like this and um i i, I guess amy do you want to add anything about the backyard farmer so other things we do three minute video segments so you can search the video segments uh they i know they have some great ones about starting your own transplant depending on how large of an operation uh lighting soil different components you want to look at um, starting your own seedlings uh, how to compost, how to mulch, how to manage tomato hornworms if they come moving in, um, or even those pollinators. How do we attract the pollinators which we need? Uh, what are things that we can put on the edge of the field or the garden to promote those pollinators? So it's a great resource. Um, I will say it is designed more for the homeowner, uh, smaller scale, but if you are a larger producer, just keep in mind, it's just the scale that you're looking at. You're just gonna make it bigger. Um, so those are great videos to look at, uh, great resources. And if you ever run into problem, if you can't get a hold of me, I already stated we meet every Thursday night from seven to eight, and then it's up on YouTube by Friday. You can email us your questions and your pictures, and we answer them. Um, if you're not on the show, somebody answers them to you via email. So definitely reach out. There's a huge group of us that do that show. Uh, lots of knowledge and availability there. And I know so South Dakota has a similar program, but it's just not, it isn't as in depth as Backyard Farmer. Uh, we've just been around for a little while. Right. I saw you have 22,000 subscribers. That's, yeah. that's something to strive for here in South Dakota. We're trying to um, build up these, these educational resources for producers, people starting out. Um, we really like to focus on our specialty producers who um, don't mm -hmm. necessarily get that extra funding or help in their operations. So this is, you know, I I like to say any extension resource, no matter what state, we can always learn something and, and make new connections because, you know, sometimes it's just nice to get out of your backyard. <laughs> it is. It is. And, you know, if you want to look at other states, other states I would lean toward would be Michigan. Michigan has a huge vegetable production. Uh, they have a lot of great resources. Michigan and Ohio State um, is where I usually go for uh, chemical recommendations just because of their large scale. I thank you again, Amy. It was a great session. This was so informative and perfect. So thank you so much. 
no problem. Anytime. I'm happy to talk about diseases anytime. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, and thank you all for watching. This segment has been funded by a partnership with Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, and the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association to promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. Again, my name is Christine Reiner. I am the communications coordinator contractor for the SD Specialty Producers. If you have any questions or want to see more about our upcoming events and information, please visit our website at sdspecialtyproducers.com.